हरे कृष्णा और मिला माता जी वेलकम टू दॉन्ग्स पॉडकास्ट वंस अगेन हरे कृष्णा थैंक यू सो मच फॉर स्पेयरिंग योर टाइम एंड रसल प्रभु ऑल दो इट्स मिड नाइट फॉर यू थैंक यू फॉर एडजस्टिंग योर स्केड्यूल एंड ज्वाइनिंग हियर फील फ्री टू चिप इन वेन एवर यू हैव टू शेयर एनी थॉट्स एंड जनरल या इट्स अ you have been doing editing of my videos quite tirelessly and competently and this is additional service in this video that's i'm grateful for that so in general when as a brahmachari i interact with uh, mata ji it's usually I, in a physical room i won't do it alone so we are following the same etiquette here and i'm grateful that you're helping me in that thank you so mata ji today i thought we could discuss broadly on the topic of writing and more specifically about pursuing writing as an art in bhakti mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so in my, how i got inspired about this topic is that you know, we have worked as uh, btg review editors and when you are reviewing some of my articles or we were re- reviewing various articles uh, you, know, you often pointed out the use of literary devices and the poetic aspect of writing apart from poetry the the aesthetics of writing i had not seen that much discussed among devotees Now, in general mm. uh, i was inspired i was always i always liked to write and when i when i, when I came to bhakti i had so many ideas i had actually a message to share but in general no, i'm not saying this in a mood of criticism it was just my experience at that time that for most devotees writing was a craft that means it was just a tool to preach okay i am giving classes but let's have some notes and let's put them in a systematic organized way not that the writing didn't have its uh, its virtues including sometimes the arti- some artistic aspect also but that was never seen as a uh, something to be cultivated so writing was more as a tool so in that sense it was like a craft we use it to communicate a message but the idea that it's not just a tool it is definitely but it, it is much more than that it is a art and as devotees we can pursue that so that was something which i found both revealing and encouraging mm-hmm. and since then i whenever i write articles i try to come up with the rhyming uh, titles for the articles or do some kind of word play and uh, i found that it also has its appeal so it becomes memorable it becomes attractive so in that sense of course word play is just one aspect of the beauty of writing and the art of writing but that was i thought that we could discuss this topic we have discussed i have had podcasts on writing earlier uh, with jaydwait maharaj and garud prabhu but i thought this particular aspect has not been focused on so maybe you could start with how you explored writing and especially the art art aspect of writing Well, I started really enjoying to write when I was a student in in a primary school, in elementary school. And my teacher in the fourth grade, when I was nine, she introduced the idea of writing with a cartridge pen, which is kind of like a fountain pen. Okay. So, you know, instead of dipping the pen in the ink, you have a cartridge of ink that you put in the pen, and then it has a, a nib, kind of like for calligraphy. Uh, the only problem is that the ink gets on your fingers. You, you basically always have this finger always has ink on it all the time, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and if you're not careful, it can smudge. And I, I for many, 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 many years, actually, until I start until I started traveling full time, I always used cartridge pens. And there, you you loved the the physical act of writing, and you were writing the thing you were writing. was a piece of art literally like okay. shri chaitanya mahaprabhu says that a rupa goswami that his handwriting it looks like pearls yeah so you It's focused on that the yes yes you focused on the fact the paper you were using the pen the ink uh were you were creating a work of art and i'm not sure at what point i got introduced to poetry i really don't remember but from certainly from a very young age writing poetry became one of my main means of journaling although i didn't think of it as journaling i wrote poetry primarily for myself although i certainly uh, i was happy when when my poetry was published in the school's newspaper and things like that and i continued that habit uh, 
until the present day, you know, to particularly to write poetry. And it, prose writing when I was young. Okay, just one minute. You mostly, said poetry. Yeah. So yes. you write it is for you as a journaling means you write it for your self expression and for your personal glorification of krishna or i know you have published yes. one book but this you are talking about poetry more as a form of journaling here is it so well, more also, for personal writing um, well krishna kanta devi dasi uh, guru yeah. prabhu's wife she published a book on poetry and she includes some of my poems there so i've also had some of my poems published although i haven't published a book of poetry um per se i published some poems on my website but it's primarily been for me uh yeah, journaling is is it doesn't really communicate what i want to communicate but it's the closest word that i can pick uh to what writing poetry does for me as as a person and what it does for me uh, both both spiritually and materially I mean, it, it's on on every level. I mean, I no longer write with cartridge pens. It took me years to transition to writing poetry on a computer. That was it was it was extremely difficult. Uh, but at this point, I I can. But it's it's something that's very satisfying emotionally, mentally, intellectually, and spiritually. And when I used to write on paper with a cartridge pen, it was very satisfying uh, aesthetically. And and physically as as well. Okay. And uh, so uh, within your bhakti journey, uh, when uh, was it natural for you to start using, start writing and journaling, or uh, especially journaling to poetry, or because uh, you know, in some ways our devotee life is quite busy. and writing is not always uh, prioritized mm. there are so many other services which are considered more important and which can very easily be more quantified in terms of yes um, yes yes when i first moved in the ashram in chicago in 1973 they kept us so busy which was good in some ways but i i think as a model of what spiritual life is it was in the long run harmful i think it was well intentioned and it was what was needed and it had some benefits but one also needs time for introspection you know probably has this phrase the introspective sage and writing and for me again especially poetry writing is a primary form of introspection that's why i say journaling doesn't really capture what i'm trying to express it's a it's a it's a mirror it's a an expression of of self and anyway in those early days the only time that was unscheduled was after the sunday feast that was my only time that i didn't have a specific schedule I'm sure I was expected to help clean up after the feast but I didn't. I would sit on the fire escape and either I would read Prabhupada's books it was my only my only time I could read other than in the the formal classes or I would write poetry. Oh okay. And I had to sneak on the on the back fire escape to do it. You know, if anybody came and found me they would have said, "Oh, come and sweep the floor." <laughs> come and wash the pots. Yeah. i think that's a big challenge and uh, bec- because at one level the notion especially in the moment i think to some extent was that you know idle time means idle mind is a devil's workshop and mm. it is true to some extent if a person is in rajoguna and tamoguna then the idle mind can be quite dangerous but then that doesn't mean that we are always going to be in those lower modes and even then also we could be productive privately so did you so over a period of time when you started writing uh do you when did you when was when did you start writing in a major way and how did you manage the time for that mm-hmm. in a major way i've been writing in a major way my whole life okay so you know i was so much writing was done of course for school and i'd say it was the syllabus writing the syllabus course material writing means or 
you're, you're well, not just there's so many, yeah, there's so many things you have to write for your school assignments. And then I'd say more that there was a break when I joined the Hare Krishna movement because it wasn't so much part of what we were being taught to do that I de definitely had some years where my writing was much less. And again, it was almost entirely poetry where whatever, whatever unstructured time I had, I was spending primarily reading. So okay. I would be spending my time reading Prabhupada's books, taking notes on Prabhupada's books, listening to Prabhupada's classes. But the idea of using unstructured time for writing, um, I mean, I did write letters to people who wrote to the BBT, but that I wouldn't call that writing in the same sense at all. Hmm, of course. Uh, I mean, we were encouraged to write articles for Back to Godhead, and I got a couple of articles published back at that time. But again, it wasn't, it just wasn't what was going on. <laughs> that you know, nobody said, make sure you have some time to write every day. Although Sheila Prabhupada said that, but that wasn't something coming from the devotees. It wasn't something talked about in the classes um, and, and, and so forth. And by the way, I think, my, my own understanding is no matter what mode of nature you're in, it's important to have some time for introspection. And it's important to have some, some time of quiet and some time when you're not just running around. That uh, busyness can be a kind of intoxication and it can be a kind, a, a way of avoiding mm. taking care of things that we need to take care of. Yeah, you know, there's um, there's this whole concept of spiritual bypassing also. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Or you know, it, it it can be a form of procrastination. I mean, even technically, like you know, there's something you really need to work on, and instead you clean your house that doesn't need to be cleaned. You know, you do a load of laundry that doesn't need to be done. You bake something that doesn't need to be baked. You know, you there's uh, they call it procrastic cleaning and procrast procrast cleaning and procrast Pasta baking and you know okay <laughs> so one can be one can be busy as a kind of avoidance and we're not meant to be just crazy busy all the time True. so all day although we say an idle mind is a devil's workshop and one should not just be sitting around with nothing to do some of what we should do for everybody should be a, a quietness and a reflection and writing very much helps with that. It's, I mean, in the last few years, I've gotten more, I've kept a diary, I guess, for about 20 years now. And for the last maybe three or four years, I've done a lot more of a reflective at length journaling. And there's a lot of evidence that doing that kind of writing helps us to process things that otherwise we have difficulty processing. Mm -hmm. there's, there's just so much evidence for that, that just sitting around thinking or talking to another person is often not as effective as, as writing. Yeah. You know, I also, in the last, I guess, two and a half years, I've been keeping a daily gratitude diary. Mm. So this also helps. It, it focuses me all of my waking hours that I'm always alert as to what I can, what I can be grateful for. So there's, I, I see a benefit on all levels for, for everybody. This is beautiful. I mean, yeah, is that writing it's as when I talked earlier about tool for outreach, that's important, but you could say writing is also a valuable tool for in reach understanding ourselves and then dealing with inner issues during this pandemic i have conducted a few courses on journaling and uh, I, I try to bring in bhagavad gita's philosophy and perspectives into the activity of journaling what is going on in terms of the inner dialogues and uh, it is a concept which those who have tried it i have personally tried it it's very helpful but for some some devotees the idea that okay if you're right First of all, writing to publish itself doesn't seem, I have had devotees asking, how many people became devotees by the, your books that were written? I don't think we can <laughs> quantif quantify like that. 
but okay if you are writing and you not in publishing what are you doing spending so many hours so maybe there are different kinds of devotees and some maybe some devotees don't feel the need for introspection and maybe they don't even need introspection and maybe you can say everyone needs but it uh, seems that some people keep functioning reasonably well without introspection so there I is a there is a certain really, i don't know uh, i mean i okay. don't know that okay. that's actually possible i mean what we might say is that it doesn't have to be writing i mean my my I, one of my granddaughters is an artist and what i can see is that she accomplishes through art and what she's explained to me is that if she doesn't produce any art for a while that her awareness of krishna becomes impeded that if she's regularly creating art her whole vision of krishna in the world shifts for her and for some people it's going to be creating music you know there there's ways it doesn't have to be the written word so the written word may not be and if we think about that yes that it wasn't sense. that long ago that people in general didn't really know much about how to read and write the vast majority of the world didn't i mean it was only a few hundred years ago that books were almost non-existent they were handwritten and you know there was no printing press and so most people didn't need to know how to read because what were they going to read there was very little to read so people's reading and writing was extremely limited um mm. and still there there are other ways of expression i think writing has it fulfills a similar function to any any kind of creative outlook uh there's and as far as writing for others my my own conviction okay just and I don't, if you don't mind yeah, just going up to this yeah. point sure yeah so it seems that uh nowadays there is uh, in, spir- in spiritual spiritual circle there is this concept of we all need me time so me time can sound somewhat seem selfish but what you are saying is that some people as you said they may they may just uh, take a take a harmonium and just sing music all alone you know sing sing bhajans or kirtans when nobody is hearing so there may be different ways in which a person may may have their needs addressed and journaling could be sure. one of the tools in it so Correct. so I, i don't know whether we could call that introspection or is a person being introspective when they are actually singing or it 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 there could be just somebody just gardening somebody goes for long walks yes and so it is it is, if it's yes that, that is its function and shil prophet himself said that when he had extra time he would sit and, and do bhajans he would get out his harmonium and sing mm. so okay so introspective cannot, the, the, the me time thing. is not me time is not selfish Yeah. and i can't i have i can't give if i have nothing to give you you can't give in charity if you don't also earn money <laughs> mm, that is true so overall writing is one way in which we can uh, nurture ourselves take care of our needs so i had thought of i had read long ago in a book on writing there are four broad ways in which we can write one is just for ourselves uh that is for introspection the second is for say sh- for our sharing with our close friends the third is for maybe publishing on uh, some community forum then the fourth is for formal publishing to the world and i have found that quite helpful categorizing because mm. every time you think about okay this i'm going to write i'm going to publish to the whole world then that itself can be quite intimidating and mm-hmm. then one may not write at all mm-hmm. so yes i found that in fact it's interesting when i was working on my novel essence seekers that at first i was writing the novel for the world and i couldn't get anywhere and then i decided just to write it for fun mm. you know that whether i published it or not i mean I ended up publishing it and i ended up having it as something that i am hoping that the world enjoys but i was yeah. i wrote it for fun and 
that, that, that I would is- suggest I would suggest that even if one has the world as the audience or or a community as the audience or some good friends as the audience, Prabhupada says in the preface of Nectar Devotion that everything we're doing is to have rasa, hmm. is to have taste. So the the primary purpose is to have a, a taste of a relationship with Krishna in everything that we do, regardless of our so-called audience. Our hmm. real audience is always the Lord. It's it's always, and this is true whether instead of writing, we're making music or we're planting flowers, which can again have the same or a similar function for people. Uh, although I think writing has certain aspects of it that are particularly helpful. But our audience is always the Lord and our relationship with the Lord. When I was writing the Learn to Read books, the children's books, of course, my audience was the children. And there were very, very strict parameters. If you want to talk about children's books writing, we could get into that a bit. It might be a worthwhile topic Mm -hmm. uh, for each of these books according to level. But what I was meditating on with every single book, every single day, was Krishna and his intimate associates reading the books and enjoying them. Oh, beautiful. So... When we are writing, it is it is in one. Prabhupada also says that writing is Shravanam Kirtanam Smaranam. Mm-hmm. So it's a devotional service in one sense, and we are doing it for Krishna's pleasure. And yes. at the same time, you know, we do so so earlier you said you're writing for writing for satisfaction, writing for fun, and going back to your that novel essence the seekers, I think that is uh, uh you were a pioneer. I don't think anybody has done a novel length allegory in our movement till now. Can you tell a little bit more about that? How you got the idea and how it... Well, there are there are some more. There was actually um, a book called the, Sa- called the... What was it? The Path of Vaishnav Sages or something like that. The Way of Vaishnav Sages that was written. And Bhakti Nautakur, of course, wrote a novel. Yeah, I was talking about in our movement. Not our tradition, uh-huh. sorry. In our moment. Yeah, Bhakti Vinod, Bhakti Vinod had two novels. Yeah. Uh, Narada Muni, uh, we have his rather short fictional stories in the Bhagavatam, Paranjana, yeah. which is uh, certainly in the same genre, although it's not as developed. And then in our movement, there was yeah, The Way of Vaishnav Sages, it was called. Uh, Tamal Krishnamaraj wrote a novel. Yeah, and, not an allegorical uh, novel, it is, I was talking about no, Narada. no, it wasn't an allegorical novel. Well, that was in the mood of Narada Muni, that Narada Muni wrote his allegorical novel. So I was picking up from that. And then the ar- allegorical novel of the journey of the soul, which is, again, the Parangina story, is uh, it's also, uh, there's a, a few best-selling books out in the world, Siddhartha by Herman Hess and uh, The Alchemist. Yes. So those are, uh, and then of course, Pilgrim's Progress, which was that's a classic, uh, you know, one of the, a real classic, which is again an allegorical novel of the soul's journey to God. So there's within the allegorical novel category, the allegorical novel of the spiritual quest is is certainly there. I mean, there's not a lot of books like that in the world, but there are some that are very, very uh, well-known and, and classics. So I was trying to follow in, in those in those footsteps. I mean, the problem with an allegorical novel of a spiritual journey is that it tends not to be a page turner kind of book. <laughs> you know, it's it's not a whodunit. Um, it, it's, it's just not the kind of book where you're going, oh, what, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? It's It's more of a meditative sort of book that you you know you read a chapter and you you think about it and you read a chapter and you think about it uh kind of thing rather than something that you devour as uh, you know an exciting plot line so that's it's sort of a peculiarity of the of the genre and 
because it's allegorical, it has many layers of, of meaning in addition to the apparent one. Hmm. So again, it was a lot of fun to write. And, you know, I love it if it became as popular as Pilgrim's Progress, but that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. It seems that uh, uh, the, the, we could say, if you look at Indian history also, the Bhakti tradition in India also spread uh, through poetry and through, we could say, the, uh, the artistic aspect, the cultural aspects. The Acharyas were the Maramacharya, Madhvacharya, they were the systematizers. But you know, for the general people, they knew it more through music or through poems. I grew up in Maharashtra in India and we knew many of the saints' poetic verses. I didn't know much about the Acharyas, but I knew a lot about these saints. So mm-hmm. in one sense that these various literary genres, of course, music itself is a genre, but poetry and uh, stories and not just scriptural stories, but retail stories. These are also a way in which outreach can be done, but it seems we haven't done that so much till now. Or maybe we are not attracting the kind of audience who is interested in uh, who who is interested in that kind of reading. Well, you- especially if you put poetry to music, and if you think about uh, our shastra, so our our primary shastras are primarily in poetic form. Mm. And they are meant to be sung. We have the Bhagavad Gita. Gita literally means a song. Mm. And I like what you're pointing out. This is true not only in the Indian tradition or the Vedic tradition, but it's true in every single culture of the world that the main way of, of transmitting cultural ideas, taking the, the revelations and the introspections of of saintly persons and putting it to music, putting it in poetic form to music. And we should say poetry is not just prose with line with a lot of extra line breaks. You know, people say- <laughs> And just last word rhymes. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe, maybe hmm. the last word rhymes. I mean, I get a lot of, uh, we, we get a lot of submissions to Back to Godhead of poetry like that just prose with extra line breaks and still people send me samples of their poetry. That's if you took out the line breaks, it's just prose. Uh, mm-hmm. But if you have the, the rhythm, the cadence, our, our body in our world is actually poetry. Yes. Sorry. Our body in our world. Our body in our world. Prabhupada says the whole world is full of Krishna's singing the whole world is based on sound and the sound is, is poetic. It's, it's not just some humming sound. It's actually poetry. Krishna says that he is poetry and everything, all the systems in our body are going through waves and, and pulses and beats and cadences and it's the same with all of the flows in the world, the flows of air and, and water and, and the movements of the, of the earth itself are all in, in rhythms and harmonies that are, that are synchronized and have, are full of ornaments of various types. So the, all of existence is like that. All of existence is is poetry to music. It is reality. The ultimate reality, of course, is the the rasa dance, the the dance to poetry and music. And the dance itself is compared, especially by Kavi Kainapur, uh, to various types of poetry. So the main way always that both philosophical truths and rasa or pleasure has been communicated throughout the world is through poetry put to music or poetry associated with art and often with artistic costumes. So Rupa Goswami has a whole section in the Bhakti Vasamrita Sindhu about the value of, of theater and poetry. And he just, that's all he says, theater and poetry. 
And I'm thinking poetry, poetry, but he's seeing the Bhagavatam as poetry. Mm. This is very f- fascinating. So in the Chaitanya Charitamut also it said that one of the characteristics of a devotee is Kavi, is Kavya. Yes. So now Kavi mm-hmm. can also mean philosopher in the Bhagavatam, Kavayo, but it also means poetry. So in the because in, they're they're together. Oh, okay. If you're genuinely a philosopher, not what Prabhupada would call a dry speculator. You know, he uses the word dry. Okay. What does it mean dry? You know, it's like if you eat some old, old, old bread and it's dry. Hmm. Then there's no rasa. Okay. Even Ayurvedically, in order to have rasa, rasa has to do with liquid. Hmm. We have rasa with us, Mr. Rasa. Mr. Rasa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I never thought of rasa. I'm filled with rasa. <laughs> filled with rasa. <laughs> Such a nice <laughs> name. Prabhupada would have liked your name. So the real philosophers find the rasa. Hmm. Rasa is, is liquid flowing and something that's liquid and flowing is also dancing and that's fascinating so, sorry i used to think when i looked at the body of work that bhakti no thakur has written you know he is quite serious systematic logical in many of his writings the way he builds up gaudiya vishnu theology in jaiva dharma especially but then he has written all these vishnu songs so i used to think that these are two such different genres of literature and how one person is so proficient in both. At all. But we are saying it's it's natural in one sense. If somebody is philosophical, they will express it through poetry. Mm. Because that is, is, it is what is. Mm. It doesn't seem to be so oh, oh, prominent in the Western philosophical tradition, isn't it? At least in the medieval and the recent most are not, I don't think any of the major philosophers from the West. Dry. So they were what dry. you call as dry speculators. Dry. Okay. Dry. Mm-hmm. So is it'll, it'll come back? Yeah, to I'm just speculating. Is the world real? Am I? Do I exist? Mm. How do I experience what I experience? That's dry. Mm. You know, real philosophy. You cannot fully separate tattva, 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 that, twa, ness, thatness. What is thatness? It's Krishna. Krishna is Tribanga. Hmm. He's in always in motion. Beautiful. So, uh, so the- that is that is it's a connecting with the with the real stream of, of life and of reality. Hmm. So the question I had is that twofold. I mean, we can go back a little bit to Rubo Goswami and Kaveh in our tradition a little later. But one is that, is overall poetry on a decline in contemporary society? And have we done enough to... Or have we done anything actually to bring this rasa aspect into, we could say, the contemporary language, which is English? Because mm-hmm. one of the ways in which I was talking about India, it is Sanskrit poetics is beautiful, but it spread widely through the local languages. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Beng- it's Bengali poetry in Bengal, it's Odia poetry in Orissa, it's Mahara- Marathi poetry in Maharashtra, then Kannad poetry in Karnataka. Telugu poetry in, uh, I was just reading about a saint. It often needs to be done primarily combined with music and perhaps also with dance and art. Okay. So to just spread poetry as poetry is difficult. And I think that that is definitely on the decline. <laughs> I mean, when I was growing up, my parents, especially my father, but my mother as well, used to regularly read me from, read to me from books of poetry. And they had their favorite poems, which they would read again and again and again. And I was, you know, surrounded with that. Uh, I, I think that that's on the decline. But okay. poetry and song is not on the decline. So yeah, definitely. songs are still one of the primary means of entertainment and communication on the planet. 
Now, the quality, I'm not very familiar with, with most modern songs. So it's difficult to say to what extent, you know, there's the ornaments of poetry. And one needs to be careful because if poetry is done merely for the aesthetics of it, if that's its only the only thing that's done, then it becomes uh, simply sensual. And although sensual pleasure is necessary for a healthy life, our bhakti idea is that everything should be connected with Krishna and that writing should be a vehicle for conveying truth, not simply aesthetics. Now, again, for society in general, pure aesthetics and sensory enjoyment is, is also necessary. People in general cannot live without some comma. That's not possible. They're, they will become psychologically disturbed. Hmm. And that's one of the roles of the shudras in Varnashram. If there's no shudras, there's no mundane rasa in society. They're the ones who provide all the beauty in the world of, of various types. And that's necessary for a civilized society. So we're not saying that people in general should give up all writing and song that is has the only purpose of being beautiful because that would be harmful for people in general but our idea as aspiring transcendentalists is that the the aesthetic beauty should be an outflowing of the fact that we're connecting with the absolute truth which is the all-pervading beauty the absolute truth is the all-pervading transcendent beauty. And therefore, our writing should be an expression of that, which includes, as you know, Rupa Goswami explains very early in Bhakti Samhita Sindhu, that the happiness of the senses and the happiness of liberation are included in the happiness of bhakti. So just like our prasadam, our food is very pleasing to the, to the senses, there's a statement in, I believe, the sixth canto of the Bhagavatam that one should smell the prasadam. <laughs> and so there's, you know, and Mahaprabhu is talking about the aroma of the prasadam, the taste of the prasadam. Also, the appearance, you know, that when you cook something, it has it's visually appealing. It's appealing to the sense of smell. It's appealing to the sense of taste. It nourishes the body. It's not, it, the fact that it is a spiritual form of worship doesn't negate the fact that it then includes everything else. So our writing should be properly ornamented. And just like in the Bhagavatam, one of the injunctions uh, with, when Kasyapa is instructing Diti is don't go out of the house without ornaments. Hmm. You know, so our, our writing should be ornamented. Huh? But the, it should be, again, a, a secondary natural result of describing reality, the beautiful, describing the transcendent, all-pervading beauty and gracefulness and, and sweetness of, of the ornamented Lord, not sensuality separate from the Lord. Mm, makes sense. So overall, So if I understand right, poetry is put in song is very popular, and to some and extent, the, sorry, and very powerful. Yes, and to some extent, the the kirtan world, in some ways, we as a movement, probably uh, Prabhupada was among the first major spiritual leaders who brought kirtan to the West, but mm -hmm. uh, we have they're not that prominent in the kirtan scene now. That could be one aspect of music also. Uh, of Absolutely. Course, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And kirtan, you know, there's nam kirtan, guna kirtan, lila kirtan. Yes. And we have, you know, the Hare Krishna mantra, which is the, the topmost expression True. Of, of poetry and music and poetry and motion. But all of the other bhajans and the songs and Prabhupada said we could also sing them in the local language. So we have some devotees who've taken the Sanskrit and Bengali songs and verses and translated them into poeticized English. Perhaps that's been done in other languages as well. Yeah, but I don't think 
Prabhupada wanted that to replace the main liturgy no. in the temple. No. Well, there's many reasons for that, for not wanting it to replace. Uh, one reason is is practical. So I can go to a program in Turkey and I know all the songs because they're not singing them in Turkish. They're singing them in Sanskrit and Bengali. Hmm. You know, I can go to a, a program in, in Bolivia and I and anywhere you go, it's the same liturgy. So that's a very practical reason. Also, the original words of the Shastra and the Acharyas have power. But Srila Prabhupada wanted us to understand what we were singing. He didn't want us to just sing songs, to just sing sounds that we didn't understand. Just like I remember one of my students saying, why do we offer our obeisances to groceries every morning? To groceries? Groceries. When they grocery, So they were, <laughs> okay. they were asking, Look, Ermila, why are we offering our respects to groceries every morning? So we need to, we, Prabhupada wanted us to understand what we were seeing. And it, it struck me very strongly one time in Sro Ganj at Bhakti Vinod Thakur's house, where uh, there were these uh, Bengali ladies singing Bhakti Vinod's Bengali songs. And I thought, for them, it, it's they're singing in their own language. Mm. Like you were saying, you know, having things in different languages. And I thought, for me, this would be like singing in English. Uh, so that can also be done. I mean, uh, Protestant Christianity has uh, really made great strides by having musicians have poetry to music about Jesus and about Christianity, hmm. which becomes very popular. And I would say that, you know, the world is starting to turn from the written word to the visual and the audible. You know, more and more people are hearing their books instead of reading them or watching their books instead of reading them. And this should be kept in mind too as writers if we're going to be writing for the public. That's interesting, yeah. It's very true that audiobooks were almost unknown maybe 10 years ago, but now audiobooks have become huge. Yes. So and just was, think, originally, wasn't that how people read before the printing press? Most people were reading by hearing somebody else read. Hmm. There was one book or two books of the Ramayana in your village because they were handwritten, and somebody would read from them every evening, and you would come for your audio book reading. <laughs> <laughs> so, or they'd be dramatized. You know, there'd be a drama on the Ramayana or a drama on the Mahabharata. And so the, this concept that people have that the move away from reading towards video and towards audio is some sort of degradation. I, I, I kind of scratch my head about it and say, well, before the printing press, that was the way that people read. It was, it was visual and audio. Hmm. So, the, so it's... It's, also, it's in one sense it's a return to tradition and, uh, so at least in some ways yeah yes so when you say we as writers we have to keep it in mind what would you mean by that we have to be more conscious of how our words sound or not use very long sentences which people can't understand when they're being read out or what would that mean that's certainly part of it but also if we're writing for a general audience we do want to think about the fact that our writing is going to be translated into somebody reading it or translated into a video. Hmm. And of course, one can write for that purpose directly. Now, the number of people sitting down with a book is definitely decreasing. That is true, very true. And uh, it's, I just processing a lot of things you said that especially about the Poetry coming out in, in the form of poetry itself, people don't sit and read, but poetry is still there. Now, with respect to writing also, you, you talked about uh, writing in various genres. So mm -hmm. one of the genres, of course, is fiction. So not many devote, as compared to the number of nonfiction books we have written, uh, I don't think that many fiction have, books have been written. 
So Correct. is is it partly because Prabhupada didn't explicitly write anything about fiction or write fiction? Or is it that just... Perhaps. Perhaps. I mean, I was just listening to a, a lecture this morning where Srila Prabhupada was talking about something and, and he was saying, these are not stories. <laughs> these are actual fact. Prabhupada often use the word stories as synonymous for fiction. Whereas, you know, generally stories can be, in English, it can mean either fiction or nonfiction. And I would hazard a guess that there was a, and perhaps still is, a pejorative concept of fiction, that fiction is not true, and therefore it cannot be truth. <laughs> However, those two things are not the same. I mean, let's say that I write a factual biography of some politician or some movie star. It, what I write can be true, but it could have absolutely nothing to do with truth. You know, a lot of the nonfiction books that are on the market today have no relationship to truth whatsoever although they are true in the sense of being a, a proper rendition of historical fact. And truth being conveyed through fiction is eternal. Beautiful. So when you say that uh, the books which are in one sense grounded in facts, but they may not be true in the sense that the way the whole facts are brought together, the narrative that is being told through that, maybe serving a particular agenda that may not be true. Is that what you're saying? That could be the case. In fact, it probably almost always is the case. But I was thinking more that it's not propounding absolute truth. It's oh, not okay. propounding tattva, thatness, hmm. sattva, existence-ness. It's okay. propounding an illusion and hmm. something that's teaching truth can be fiction or nonfiction. Right, okay. So nonfiction. So you could write, yeah. you, you know, like, like if I write a, bi a biography of a saintly person, and if I tell a fictional story, like the Perunjana story, they can both be teaching truth. Hmm. And the, the biographical story doesn't necessarily teach truth better than the fictional story, or the fictional story wouldn't be a staple of conveying truth eternally, which it is. Yes. And now we might ask why. Why ever use fiction? All fiction is to some extent, um, if it's teaching truth, metaphorical it's standing in for for something that is historically factual or it's standing in for some kind of concept it's a, it's symbolic it's representation it's representative fiction often bypasses our ego more the fact that it's a story about something that didn't happen or that couldn't happen relaxes our inner defensive mechanism, which is normally quite strong. Mm -hmm. We are generally in a mood of defending our false ego and our pride and our social status, et cetera, 24-7. Uh, <laughs> uh, but when we are involved in something that's fictional, we tend to relax that. We tend to consider something fictional to be, enter to be entertaining to be relaxing and not to be, okay. not to be aggressive against us. Mm. And one can communicate very strong truths through fiction that are extremely difficult to communicate through nonfiction. Mm. I mean, it's the, the ability to really hit people's faults and ego and to really challenge people again to be introspective and to improve is much easier in fiction because people are more receptive to it just naturally just kind of by design 
Yeah. So it has its its use. At the same time, you don't want everything fictional. Um, the basis of nonfiction is it's much more of a template. So if I'm writing something that actually has happened, then it's much e- much easier for me as the reader or the listener to assume that what's being put forward is possible. Now, then you have nonfiction that's not narrative. You have nonfiction that's explanatory. And that has quite a different purpose in society. I mean, we also find that the majority of scripture, especially that's designed for the people of Kali Yuga, is in both the narrative and poetic format. It's narrative poetry. Poetry Most of it is not. That the writing of like the Bhagavatam, the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it has a meter. It has uh, external internal rhyme. It has various poetic ornaments like consonants and, and assonance and hmm. personification and hyperbole. And so it, it there's parts of the Bhagavatam, of course, that are written in prose, but the majority is written in poetry. And that's true for the most of the Vedas. It's written as poetry. The Ramayana is all written as poetry, but it's a poetic narrative. It's not descriptive poetry. It's not describing, you know, a a cherry, cherry blossom trees or something. It's it's telling it's telling a generally a an historical narrative, a nonfictional story. So the value of that is that again, there's a real template. And of course, when what you're describing are the pastimes of the Lord and the devotees, so Rupa Goswami <laughs> says very clearly that one actually will experience or can experience the emotions and the rasa of those previous devotees by either seeing a drama or by reading poetry, which is the the Shastra. So as writers, what we want to do, we want our, we want ourselves to be experiencing rasa while we're writing. And we want our, our readers or listeners or viewers (laughs) to have that experience as well. That is really the entire purpose of the thing. And when we're glorifying the Lord and the Lord's devotees, then if we're doing it in a way that the audience, the readers can enter into the emotions of those persons, then they will also experience trasa. It is possible to write about the truth in a dry way. (laughs) One kid, that's possible. It's, it's difficult. You've got to work at it um, because the, the absolute truth is not like that. But if you really put your mind to it, you can dryify it. Like, you know, you can I take it. <laughs> you can, you can, yeah. just like I, I like to purchase uh, dried fruits uh, to offer to my deities because they keep for a very, very long time. So I can travel with that, you know. Um, but if they're too dry, then they're they're not edible. They just become almost like paper, right? And you have to reconstitute them with, with water. So you're taking this very juicy, like we have dried mangoes, right? Mango is so juicy, you eat it and it gets all over your face and your clothes. Mm. And it makes a big mess, right? And But you can dry it out. So it is possible to take the uh, the descriptions of the Lord and the Lord's devotees and the descriptions of the philosophy of Krishna consciousness, which is very juicy <laughs> and dripping, <laughs> and and dry it out so that it becomes you know, kind of chewy and, and difficult to assimilate. That is possible, but generally our, our our writing should be like that. And when the basis of our writing is poetry, then our prose will be also infused with that. Our prose writing will be infused, although it won't be, you know, technically at a particular cadence, the, the feel of poetry, the feel of motion and, and rhythm and, and ornamentation and beauty will, will be pervasive. That the writing itself, the topic should not be dry. The way of approaching the topic should not be dry and the language should not be dry. Mm. It's so. It, this is an amazing point that 
ultimately we are not just convincing the head we are ultimately trying to appeal to the heart so that's our that's the essence of our tradition so there could be logic and all those logic and structure has to be there but but we also need to connect help people ex- enter the world that is of of bhakti and that means experience oh, yeah. yes it's it's interesting you know in rupa goswami giving what is the qualification for vaidhi bhakti but bhakti according to the regular principles and he gives three levels of qualification because the regular principles are coming from the shastra so if you're going to practice uh bhakti out of faith in shastra your qualification is how much faith do you have in shastra <laughs> if you have a little bit of faith then you're not very qualified for taking up bhakti according to shastra if you have strong faith although you can't necessarily convince others then you have a medium qualification and if you have strong faith and you can convince others any argument that comes up you go oh i have a verse for that i have a verse for that uh, hari parshad prabhu uh, is visiting here and he's like that any question that anybody asks he immediately he had his computer hooked up to the a monitor and he immediately goes to his computer and within 2 minutes he has the the corresponding verse to answer that doubt so if your knowledge of the shastra is that strong and your faith in the shastra is that strong then you have the highest qualification for taking up bhakti based on the regulation of the scriptures however rupa goswami says that the only qualification for taking up bhakti is a taste that's all mm. so in addition to that you are more qualified if you know the scriptures and you have faith in the scriptures but the only qualification is taste there's a friend of mine who drives a, an uber and he is always playing kirtan in his car plus he keeps some some books some of prabhupad's books and if anybody says to him spontaneously oh i really like that music what's that music then he says to them do you like to read and if they say yes he gives them a book so he's looking for taste there's a person say i like so of course some of the stimulus for having taste is definitely the descriptions of the shastra and the descriptions of philosophy and one of the uh, anubhavas is discussing the shastra and reaching logical conclusions based on shastra those are exhibitions of taste but just convincing somebody intellectually in my experience is useless if a person has no taste the intellectual conviction doesn't translate into anything at all and if a person has taste even if their faith is very and their knowledge is very low they are still qualified to begin so certainly we want people to have faith and knowledge in the shastra as a qualification for taking up bhakti but we want to teach the philosophy mostly because the philosophy is also sweet and beautiful and and full of poetry the philosophy itself is it's simply beauty and, and movement and again rhythm in a in a form of logic and logic is also like that if you think about you know if you study logic and I, i've been teaching logic for for decades you know or you teach mathematics and i i never did get that high in mathematics but those who are mathematicians uh, like my good friend rukmini who's got a phd in mathematics and mathematics is also like that. it's full of rhythms it's full of patterns it's full of beauty it's full of ornaments you know we think of mathematics as something dry but it's not at all and i'm not even just talking about ge- the geometric aspect of mathematics but just how the numbers work together it's 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 full of grace and it's it's full of beauty mm. this is a whole so to, to think to think well am i aiming for the head or the heart i mean that that's that's probably useful in trying to organize what we write and what we put together but i would say although it's useful it has its uses it's something like saying this is material and this is spiritual sarvakalami dham brahma that in the beginning one may need to distinguish this is material this is spiritual that that's useful it is useful however at a certain point one can also come to see that everything is spiritual so 
this dichotomy between the intelligence and Rasa is, again, it's a useful construct in the beginning, but ultimately that kind of duality is not, is not real. Okay. Yeah, ultimately, you know, we as human beings can't be separated in head and heart. We are also... And even if you think, you know, Sanskrit, the terms for mind and the terms for heart are basically the same. Yes, that's true. Mora Man Vrindavan, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says many times, and Prabhupada translates that as a heart. Yes. So, yeah, it's true. Actually, this is a whole universe of bhakti and... Uh, uh, the, uh, the whole dimension of bhakti in terms of poetics, which is which is usually appealing, and uh, I hope that uh, you know, that more and more for me it's also it's a many of the things which you said I have read them in scripture, but I never uh, consciously dwelt on them. Mm. It's, 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 it's beautiful to contemplate it that way. You, know, you talk about math, yeah, there is rhythm definitely. I studied science. I so physics, the whole universe has rhythm to it, the way that even the planets move in their orbits. And uh, that, that, so if we consider that Krishna has ultimately fashioned the universe, then he will bring not just, we could say, a, a coherent order, but also an aesthetic order to it. Sure. Yeah. So maybe a couple of uh, concluding questions. Unless, of course, the discussion, you want to take it in particular directions, which I have not addressed. So one is that, is this poetic aspect uh, something we consciously strive for? Because not everybody seems to have the same level of poetic ability. And I don't want to leave our readers with the impression that writing is more difficult. Writing in bhakti has to be more difficult than what it already seems to be. Because writing itself is hard work, putting, sitting down and organizing one's thoughts. And if when someone starts thinking that writing, I have to also make my writing poetic. I have to also bring rasa into my writing. So that might make things seem much more intimidating. So is this something which we, which some people will naturally be blessed with this ability? And uh, well, even of, if course. Some... of course, there's always, uh, probably said everyone has some extraordinary talent. So... And some people have rare talents and some people have more commonly distributed talents. So certainly... Beautiful way of putting it. Now that so some people certainly. are less talented, but some people have talents which are no. common. So exactly. They may not be noticed. Yeah. Exactly. Just like there are so many people who are very good cooks. Hmm. I know thousands of people who are very, very good cooks. But how many people are, you know, Olympic gymnasts? <laughs> But being talented is a very good cook, even if there's, you know, 100 people in every block who are very good cooks, is not less valuable in society. In fact, we might say it's more valuable than being an Olympic gymnast, although each of them have their, their value in society. Um, everybody can write a gratitude diary. Hmm. And it doesn't necessarily have to be poetic when you're writing it. It should be poetic in the sense that it is a beautiful expression of love. It doesn't necessarily have to be written in rhyme and meter and with literary ornaments. Mm. But to write something every day. I mean, I have a little app on my phone called Pleas uh, Presently, which is as simple as you could possibly have. It just gives you a place to write something every day. And there's a little inspirational quote to you or something just to give you a little a little pat on the head, but everybody can do that. I mean, it, this takes two or three minutes a day, maximum mm. changes your whole quality of life is proven medically to improve your health. And very much connects you with Krishna. Mm. You know, it's, and it's, this is, and it also, brings your day into a meditative state. You know, just I'm grateful today for the for the sun, for the water, <laughs> whatever. And the more specificity you can have, the better. So you don't not just, I'm grateful for my my mother. I'm grateful for my mother. I'm grateful for you know I'm grateful I got to spend time reading Bhagavad Gita with my 
I'm grateful I got to take my mother to the store today when she needed it. You know, something that's specific. So everybody can do that. You don't have to have any particular talent to do that. And everybody can write some uh, write something every day as what have they realized in Krishna conscious philosophy that day. Mm. And again, it can be, you know, we're talking a minute or two, right? A sentence, two sentences. It doesn't, and you could publish it if you want to and share it if you want to and not if you don't want to, it doesn't really matter. And it should be poetic in the sense that it should be an outpouring of, of affection and, and love and appreciation, not necessarily technically, but that's also part of the dance. Mm. Prophet says the aim of this Krishna consciousness movement is to join the pleasure dance of the Lord. But he also says in Krishna book in regard to Ras Lila that the whole world is full of Krishna singing and the whole world is full of Krishna's dancing. So when we write something like that, we are actually contributing to that dancing and singing of the Lord. We're adding our, our voice to it. And, and it can be something quite, quite simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. And again, it doesn't take much time. And doing that changes your whole perspective all day because you're thinking about it. What am I going to write today? What am I going to write today? One of the most interesting things I did in that regard, it was, it was a Facebook challenge, which I usually ignore, but it was a Facebook challenge of 10 days of writing about something you love, not people or animals. And, and then every day challenge somebody else. So every day I'd be thinking, okay, I've got to post something today. This is one of the benefits of writing for others, by the way. It gives you an impetus to do it. And okay, I've got to write today about what I love. And so I'd be thinking, what do I love? What do I love? What do I love? I think we talked about this before. Yes. And yes. And I realized how much by doing that, I was constantly looking for the positive in my life. All day long, I was, I was, it was always there. It was a running thing. What is it that I, that I love in my life? And it just changed how I was, I, I, my, my natural joy so much increased. Uh, how my life is full of things that I love. Because one can easily see one's life in another way. And, and it helps to hone that. You know, if you just say to some, just say, well, think about what you're grateful for. Or think about how you realize Krishna or think about, you know, but if I know I've got to put it in writing, if I know at the end of the day or sometime during the day, I've got to write down, what do I love? What am I grateful for? How have I had some realization of Krishna? Then you're, you know, it, 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 I, this is going to sound terrible, but it almost sounds like feels like a school assignment, you know. Okay, I got to do that. But it's something that's so joyful that you're glad you have to do it. It it pushes you to do what you want to, and it, yeah. it changes everything. You know, on, on a material level, it can be oh, I got to do the laundry again. To wow, I'm so grateful I have a enough clothes that I can wear some clothes and wash some clothes and have some clothes drying. And I've got enough sets of clothes to, to, ha to have that, how, how grateful I am. And it can go to, Oh, wow. You know, the water is, is purifying. Krishna is the purifier and I'm hanging my clothes outside and purifiers. I am the wind and Krishna is the wind and he's the light of the sun drying my clothes. And he's the heat and fire drying my clothes. You know, it can, it can lead to that. And again, if you know you're going to write something, okay, every day I've got to write something. Then it, it pushes that. Now, if you're writing like that, at a certain point, you may decide, hey, you know, this is something I'd like to share. Again, do I want to share it with friends? Do I want to share it with community? Do I want to share it with the world? I think if we start out from the platform of, I should write something to share with the world. It may not be as effective. But anyway, you, getting back to your original question, do you have to be a master of the craft? No. However, 
it behooves us to try, this is one of the 26 qualities of a devotee is daksha. It behooves us to try to develop some expertise in what we are doing. If you're planting tomatoes, my granddaughter's growing a garden, one of my granddaughters, and she's becoming expert in what kind of soil to use for growing tomatoes. Hmm. You know, if we're going to cook, should we just throw something together or should we develop some expertise? What goes with what? What, you know, don't boil eggplants. Eggplants have to be cooked at a high temperature. You have to bake them or fry them. You don't boil them. Same with plantains, you know, and then other things, something like carrots. You can have it raw. You can have it steamed. You can have it, you know, baked. You can have it all different things. So some er some level of expertise. So anything we we work on, we should aim for some level of expertise. We might not develop enough, enough expertise in writing that we're going to, you know, win some kind of, of, of award for it or or publish in the in the millions of copies. <laughs> What? That's beautiful. So actually, if we keep doing something, we will, to some extent, improve at it, and then. Oh, the oh no! Oh, I'm going to interrupt you. Oh no! 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 That's not true, because you could keep doing it wrongly. Well, most likely, what I meant by that. No. Is, oh no. Oh no, no. no. Let me complete what I'm saying. Okay. Let. If we are doing something and uh, if it is uh, something which we are seeking some kind of uh, meaning and purpose and fulfillment through it, mm -hmm. then we will be like, I feel Dadami Buddhi Yogam Tam, Krishna will guide us to improve it. Like somebody may not yes. really have read anything about journaling, but they start writing down their thoughts. And they're not writing them simply to as a ritual, but are then uh, now they're not writing it necessarily to uh, so that the whole world will applaud it. So the point I was making is just it's not. I fully agree that just automatically doing something will not lead to improving it mechanically. It's not. But when say it's not that somebody to journal has to necessarily lead a dozen books on journaling. If That's we, also true. Yes, so, but having. Having some guidance and especially getting some feedback. Yes. So um, having some guidance that can give you feedback. Um, I mean, just like, you know, you've sent me things that you've written and asked me for feedback. Yes. Right. Yeah. And this is. Uh, In general, I find the, that without that writing is. Uh, it's like almost we are lost inside our own head. Mm -hmm. because okay I had written my thoughts but it's very difficult to be self-critical at least immediately maybe Correct. after a week or a fortnight or a month if we read something then it's it's a can have a more objective way of looking at it so I find that immensely helpful and yes. what, what I but yes. what also I say is that okay like some people may just write something and take some feedback and just leave it at that in one sense one has to practice writing it mm. is there yes, is no one has that, to imbibe the feedback yeah. And incorporate that. So there, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And I have benefited immensely from that. So when I was saying that, that there is no substitute to practicing. Is it practicing alone will improve? That's not my point. That we may take feedback, we may read books. But all those, like you said earlier, those all could become excuses for not writing. Because I'm not skilled yes, enough. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, I, I, I can't write because I have to read another book about writing. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it's also, you know, and, and you've had experience with this also as a back to God and editor, that writing is perhaps one of the areas where people resist getting any negative feedback most strongly. You know, writing is so much an expression of oneself that, and negative feedback is really hard to take. I remember we had a person who, uh, whose article we approved for publication in Back to Godhead, but we wanted the author to change three sentences, I believe, in the, in the article. So months were going by and the person hadn't resubmitted it. And I finally, I, I ended up seeing this person in my travels 
And I said to this devotee, why haven't you resubmitted your corrected article? And the devotee said, well, you, you didn't like it. None of you liked it. I said, we all loved it. We, there were three sentences that we wanted to have changed. And the person said, oh, I, I can't. I can't do it. I can't change my writing. You, you change it. And, and so this, this resistance, or we've had people submit articles for Back to Godhead, and you ask them to change some things, and they just say, oh, never mind. Just don't even publish it then. Right? You just forget it. I, I withdraw it as a submission. And, uh, I, you know, I, I run into that. People send me their, their writing. And I usually just say, oh, very, very nice. <laughs> I don't usually give them any feedback because I know that most people are highly resistant to getting any honest feedback on their writing. But if we want to really become expert, that's what's required to solicit honest feedback and to honestly solicit honest feedback. <laughs> so if that happens too, people will say, you know, Here's my essay or my poetry of this. What do you think? And, and, and I've had experiences. They don't really want to know what I think. They really want me to say, yes, yes, very good. But anything else that I say is not, is not uh, digested. So if we want to improve, that's the way. That's the way in everything. You know, to honestly solicit honest feedback and then to, to be receptive to that and to take it on board mm, true that's i think that is something which at least from btg uh, writing i learn immensely from that and now it's not always possible to have uh, senior devotees give feedback but i found even our equals or sometimes even our younger devotees if we are open they can give some feedback and that also helps if you are open to taking mm -hmm. it and uh, one reason I find that some devotees are very resistant to taking feedback is that it's it's almost like a one zero thing for them. Either it is mm -hmm. good or it's not good. Like even that particular yes, yes. article you mentioned, it's good and you accept it as it is. Otherwise, just forget everything. Correct. correct. It's, it's, we never approach anything else in life like that. Why should we approach writing like that? You know? I think because it's such a, a manifestation of ourself. Hmm. And, you know, what I found when I was getting feedback for Back to Godhead articles that I had written, that often the editors wanted me to remove or amend the sentences that I loved the most. You know, the sentence I'd written is like, this sentence is the jewel of the universe eternally. You know, the construction, the language, the concept, look at this beautiful sentence. And that would be the first one that the editors would go, this is awful to you. <laughs> then you would just do yeah. oh. they, they murder your darlings, you know, kill your darlings. Yes, yes you, you've murdered my babies. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, uh, uh, but it's often like that. And if we want to become skilled in the craft, that that is, you know, I mean, sometimes I'll keep it an older version of an article just for to read it, so I can hold on to that that sentence that was that was murdered in the in the published version. Uh, but I also found, and this is quite interesting, when you work with a with a good editor, is that you know the editor will point out to you, "Hey, this needs to be fixed, and that needs to be fixed," and some of the things you can readily agree to, and other things you're like, "What's wrong with this editor?" Why are they commenting like this? Such a situation almost always points to the fact that you weren't communicating clearly, that the editor was responding to what they thought you said instead of what you actually intended to say, and that therefore you need to change your, your way of communicating. So as far as, far as improving our, our craft, you know, honestly solicited, solicitating honest feedback and especially from those more skilled in the craft. And that's that's true for everything that we do. And if we want to make nice offerings to Krishna, then that's our responsibility. Mm. You know, it's not like, I love you, Krishna, so I can, you know, just give you any old thing. That's, you know, I'm not going to just throw some old torn cloth on the deities or 
or some improperly cooked offering or something that's, you know, and Mahaprabhu was so careful. He would have Swarup Damodar review all of the writing before he would read it. And it said that Swarup Damodar was looking for Rastabasa. So I think that this is, this concept is not well understood. When we look at this part of the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, Rasa again is taste. It is, it's, it's pleasure. It's what we're living for. Ananda Maya Biasat, we're pleasure seeking. And pleasure means rasa, some sort of experience. And that this rasa has, has five parts to it. The, the basic relationship, what, what is an impetus for that relationship, the transitory emotions that nourish that relationship, and the voluntary expressions of that relationship, and the automatic expressions of that relationship. When those come together, as separate ingredients, they form rasa, just like uh, when you put together the different literary ornaments, you have a piece of writing. Now, some things go together well, and some things don't go together well, mm -hmm. right? Like you're not going to mix bitter melon and honey, it, you know, and you're not going to mix red cabbage and eggplant. Now, certain things just don't mix. You're not going to put chutney on top of your sweet rice. And mm -hmm. if you mix things improperly, your taste either disappears, either there's no taste, there's no pleasure, or your taste becomes a semblance. And a basa means a semblance. It means a shadow or a reflection. So if you mix things improperly, you get a shadow or a reflection of taste instead of taste, or you get no taste at all. And what's a, it's an improper mix depends on what the predominant mood is. You know, like laughter and sorrow are an improper mix. You're not going to, you know, you don't start laughing at misfortune. Hmm. If someone's, you know, laughing at a funeral, it's, it's the, the Karuna Ras becomes disturbed. Hmm. So the, the main idea of feedback is that what we write needs to be full of rasa. And so that means how we mix things, how we explain things, what goes with what, should be producing a genuine taste of spiritual life. Not the absence of taste and not a shadow of taste or a, or a reflection or a semblance of taste, which is what rasa basa means. Hmm. So, you know, the way you have brought concept of rasabhas from a transcendental level, something which we can easily relate with, that's nice. Yeah, I've seen that sometimes it's one thing to, when we are reading something and it's like sometimes the, somebody who's not a very good writer, their tone suddenly changes, they use words inappropriately. And suddenly, from gen, I mean, it's not exactly rasabhas, but something from gentle, suddenly it becomes harsh and... Uh, one part of it is very open, non-judgmental, and suddenly it becomes... That, that is, you are describing Rastabas. Yeah. That's what you're describing. That things, that the different elements of taste or the different types of taste have mixed wrongly or inappropriately, which then causes you to either lose the pleasure in the thing or to get just a semblance of pleasure in the thing, to get just a, a shadow of pleasure. So that is exactly what you're describing. And that is the, that is the essence of the craft of, of writing or speaking, but writing, because we're focused on writing, is, is not even so much the literary ornaments, which are important, mm -hmm. but to, to know how to help people actually develop a taste in the service of the Lord and not something that is distasteful. I mean, look, we've all been, I'm sure, to uh, classes in the Hare Krishna movement that left us discouraged and diminished our taste rather than nourished us. Isn't it? I mean, we, we've all had that experience. That we'll hear some kind of preaching or some kind of explanation, and instead of giving us encouragement, 
it gives us discouragement. Instead of giving us happiness in Krishna consciousness, it, it, it causes us to have doubts. It causes us to have difficulty. So that was some mm-hmm. improper mixing, something that was inappropriate that then either destroys or diminishes the experience of relationship with the Lord. Hmm. True. So I think this is something which we can, if somebody is not having great poetic sense, this is something which you can easily relate with and you can fix this. Correct. That, that itself will at least not impede the, the, the flow of the message and the mood of the message which we are giving. We won't Correct. be at least come. The way we are presenting it won't come in the way. So, Correct. Then yes. Prabhupada mm-hmm. said once, how did you attract everyone? Prabhupada says, Krishna is at all attractive. I just presented him. Yes. So, so in some ways we can say that's our service also. It's uh, yes. yeah. So through writing or through poetry or through whatever way we use. Yes, hmm. Any concluding points you would like to say? Russell Prabhu, uh, would you like to also comment anything? Uh, no. Yeah, you covered it we went very well. Thank uh, you. Mataji, yeah. any concluding points you would like to share? You mentioned about um, your books. So if you want to share something about your books, we will put links to your books also online in the in the YouTube description. Well, I've, I've done... Um... On Amazon, I have uh, two books that I've written myself. One is The Great Mantra for Mystic Meditation. Uh, it's a fairly simple book, about fairly simple, fairly short, about how to avoid the 10 offenses in chanting. Mm-hmm. And the, it was originally back to God, separate Back to Godhead articles. And then there's the allegorical novel, Essence Seekers. And I would ask, uh, that's also available in Spanish. Oh, he has got so there. We go. Look at that. All right. Essence Seekers is also uh, it's won an award. Uh, so Essence Seekers is both of them are available as print and Kindle. Essence Seekers is also available as Audible. And Essence Seekers is available print English, Kindle English, print Spanish, Kindle Spanish, and English uh, audio, uh, audio. Oh, okay. So and then one of the things I noticed about your great mantra is you have got very beautiful illustrations in it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah. I like to follow in Prabhupada's footsteps of having of having illustrated books. So then there's also some books that I've contributed to and produced. There's the illustrated Bhagavad Gita book. Uh, that's really become a big hit. Uh, that's That seems to be one of the, the best-selling books. So that's a book with many, many contributing authors, uh, although I produced it and I contributed parts of it. And then there's Raghunath Goswami's Manashiksha, which I produced that book. And I, again, I contributed to it. I wrote a chapter in the beginning and I wrote commentary on each of the verses. So that has 120 black and white illustrations and 12 color pictures, all that were commissioned uh, for that book. And that's Raghunath Swami's step-by-step guide to attaining spontaneous devotion with the commentary of Bhaktivinoda Thakur and also commentary of contemporary Vaishnavas such as Jayadrita Swami, Bhaktivyanamara, Satyananda Maharaj. Uh, myself. Uh, so that's uh, Sri Ram Swami. So uh, that's a, it's only 12 verses, but the book is this big with all the, all the illustrations and all of the commentaries. And uh, those, those are all available on, on Amazon. That's uh, like magnum opus, I would say. It's a, it's a huge uh, yeah, Or maybe something yeah. will come up more. Yeah. So books. that's available as print and Kindle. And somebody did make an audio book, although it's not available on audio platforms. But on my YouTube channel, you can get the audiobook of, of Manishiksha. So somebody did turn that into an audiobook. And then the other um, books that I produce right now, they're only available from Mantra Lingua Publishing in the UK, unfortunately. And this is a series of children's books. Um, actually, I would like to say something about producing books for children before we end, if that's all right. Yes. So that's a series of books to teach how to read English. And there's 42 color books and 41 activity books. And together, it's a complete liter- literacy program uh, at world-class standards. We work with the Institute of Education in London, and we work with the Nelson Thorns PM Publishing, a major publisher of literacy books. So it's uh, very, very systematically done. Each book is following very, very rigid standards of what constitutes a particular level of difficulty in English reading. 
So the the word, the phonetic construction of the word, the spellings of the word, the lengths of the sentences, the type of punctuation, the size of the font, the type of the font, how many sentences per page, the relationship between text and picture, the uh, number of sentences in the story and the concepts of the story, all of these are tightly regulated as to level of difficulty. And what this means is that the children will constantly feel a sense of success. They, they won't be presented with anything that's out of sync with what they're able to do. And the, the stories all being about Krishna, of course, are fun to read because Krishna is fun. So one thing I would like to add about children's books, because when, when our own children were young, there were not very many children's books about Krishna, and now they're being produced in large quantities, is that often the people producing books for children do have not studied leveling of books. So they just think, well, this is the children's book. And the problem is, if your sentence structure is is at one level and your vocabulary is at a different level, it's very unpleasant to read. So the child that can read the higher sentence structure is not going to enjoy the vocabulary level. And the child that can grasp the vocabulary level will be intimidated by the sentence structure. So this, there's this mismatch in most of the books I'm seeing that are produced for children. The authors have not taken the time to study how to produce books for people who are at different levels of reading and how to, how to integrate all of those elements. And the, and the very sad result is that a lot of those books, the children don't read. You know, we, we, we buy the book, we spend money on the book, we have the book in our, and the children are not, they're not interested to read it because it doesn't correspond to any particular place of where they're at or the use of very strange fonts, um, very, you know, swirly fonts, which are difficult for children who are learning how to read, to read the letters in those fonts. Uh, putting fonts on a colored background, we see this very commonly, that the, the fonts or the writing is merged with the illustration in such a way that makes it more difficult to read. So that all of these, also when you're writing for children, one should know how to write a good story. So when I met with uh, Beverly Randall, who has written 800 children's books for Nelson Thorne's PM, and she was telling me, make sure it's a real story. Make sure that all your stories have a beginning, middle, and end. And make sure the children are always the heroes of the story. Don't have the adults be the heroes while the children are the fools. Uh, the children like to see themselves as, the, as heroes or some other you know, children's heroes. So the, these are some things that, that are, are certainly, uh, it would be helpful now that people are producing uh, so many children's books. And if you're producing activity books for children, Again, study something about education. <laughs> study something about, you know, I've, I've asked many devotees who advertise I'm teaching this or that, and I'll say, what is your pedagogy? And they don't even know what I'm talking about. So if you, when it's going to do like the, my what? <laughs> and so if you're going to produce children's books that have activities for children, then it would be wise to spend some time understanding what are effective and what are ineffective teaching methods. And again, what are effective and ineffective teaching methods at different levels so that you're not having a mismatch between the content part of the book and the activity part of the book. Mm. That's true. Actually, this level, it matters for everyone, but for children, it will matter a lot. Because yes, they because they haven't the mastered. There. Yeah, exactly. They haven't mastered all the skills. And therefore, if you're, if you're simultaneously giving them things that are far too easy for them, along with things that are far too hard for them, mm. there's, it doesn't work. They won't read it. Yeah. I can sense this sometimes when I'm traveling, devotee, the congregation asks me to speak to their children, but then there are children from five-year-old to 20-year-old. And it's <laughs> very difficult to speak. So we don't want to insult the intelligence of the 20-year-old, but at the same time, we don't want to exhaust or uh, just you know, overwhelm the five-year-old. So that's just for one talk for half an hour, 45 minutes, one hour. But if a whole book is definitely yeah. a significant challenge. 
And it's one of my great sorrows because, you know, for so many years, I wanted there to be more children's books. And now that they're being produced more and more and more, the majority of them, the children don't like. Hmm. You know, you buy them and you think, oh, I'm buying a children's book. And the children don't like it. They won't read it. And then you know, it's very they, easy to actually guilt or shame them for not wanting to read. Yes, uh, yes. It's also yes. to say that you know, today's children don't read books. They just want to yeah. play video games or something like that. But that's not true in one sense. That there are there are a lot of books being produced. Even, and not just like trashy books, but books people are reading. It's not that they're not reading. So, that is also very true. Yeah. Hmm. True. Well, thank you very much for asking me to speak on this topic. Yeah, I'm so happy. We learned a lot. Let me, if, if you're okay, I'll just try to quickly summarize. It was very broad in the discussion. And then, so we discussed the, broadly the topic of writing as an uh, art in bhakti. And uh, it started with your experience of calligraphy writing and how that was at itself, with the, what you produced with writing is itself artistic. And from there, within bhakti, Within our movement, we had to squeeze out time to write, and especially then as a teacher, as a teacher and educator, uh, pioneering a school, leading a school, you had you had to write a lot. So, with respect to writing, we discussed primarily, or one of the key things is what everyone can do is write privately as a journal. You said you talked about how in poetry it could also be used for expressing one's heart, and through its its journaling. Everybody needs some way that they rejuvenate themselves, some me time. It could be through walking in nature. It could be through music. But journaling is a powerful way. And later on, you talked about how writing a gratitude journal can help us see how our, how our life is already so rich. Otherwise, it is easy to feel resentful or negative. And throughout the day, we can be looking at what we are writing. So we don't have to have necessarily poetic skills for writing. Uh, but what we express in our private writing could be a expression of our love, our affection. And if we want a devotee is also Daksha. So a devotee will want to improve and improvement doesn't come just by simple practice. It comes by you can practice with guidance and the diligence to incorporate uh, that guidance into one's practice of writing. And then the point about how Philosophy was traditionally also conveyed through poetic means. That's why the two meanings of the word kavi, philosopher and poet, they are not two distinct meanings. Those two categories overlap in many ways. And the, that kind of uh, philosophers are distinct from the dry speculators, as Prabhupada calls them. And so our writing, ultimately, the purpose is to help people experience rasa. You know, enter into enter into Krishna's message, Krishna's pastimes, Krishna's presence. So, of course, we are not separating the head and the heart because the person is integrated, and what is written can appeal to both. So, then, uh, with respect to poetry, although just reading poetry may have gone down, but poetry put to music and song is poetry sung as song and put to music is immensely popular and it's powerful also. Prabhupada also wanted the traditional songs of, to be put in local languages in the world. And while we are writing, you know, it's a, you know, we could write for the world, but when we write for, in one sense, write to express ourselves, write for fun, then we, we can actually bring ourselves into the writing more and better. And then that can, that can reach the world in a more authentic way. So with respect to writing in... Uh, Writing in various genres, there is fiction is fiction is sometimes seen uh, uh, pejoratively because oh as it's all just just false, but fiction can educate one more about truth and sometimes true facts may not actually take one toward the truth. So it's uh, it's the content that is important or the content in the objective that is important. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur wrote fiction and then. Uh, then there are others who have written, and then you also wrote Essence Seekers. And uh, it's a full length allegory. And you also discussed about when we are writing, it's important to be able to take feedback. Because it's so personal, 
So it's difficult, but if you can take that, that's very helpful in improving. And then while personal writing for ourselves is good, one advantage of writing for others is that if we are it's like you say a 10 day challenge or something like that, then there is some, some deadline, some external pressure that makes us write and that forces us to think also. And uh, with respect to the, especially toward the end, you talked about writing for children. You know, the books that, series of books that you have written, they are a landmark in for educating and bringing Krishna into what could be mainstream education, a resource for mainstream education. So for writing for children, especially a level appropriate is important. Otherwise, it can be painful for others. They'll just not want to read. So I think that the last point about level appropriate writing is something which also applies for everyone. But at the same time, that is that difference is not so much. But for children, it becomes a huge difference. So, of course, you mentioned how the whole universe is filled with poetry, with poetry put to music and song. Ultimately, it's Krishna who is Krishna in the spiritual world. It's Katha, Ganam, Natyam. But even in the material world, there is Krishna's song going on. And when we try to glorify Krishna through our abilities, then we are participating in Krishna's song, Krishna's dance that's happening in the material world. And some of us, everybody has some special talents, but some of us may have extraordinary talents and some of us may not may have ordinary talents. But still the talents are there and uh, we use them to glorify Krishna in our own way. Of course, there are many other points we discuss, but anything you would like to add as a conclusion? I think that's all perfect. You got everything. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to have you and look forward to your associate once again. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Shri Prabhupada ki jai. Hare Krishna. Shri Prabhupada ki jai.